Welcome back, everybody, to our Friday night Bible study. We are studying the Messiah's calendar, uh, going through the Hebrew feasts and uh, in the sanctuary. So we've been uh, cruising right along. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. We're studying lesson number 13, and this is the Feast of Pentecost. We're on page 96 in our syllabus. Please make sure you have your Bibles with you tonight. Um as we have quite a few uh, verses that aren't typed out in your syllabus, you need to uh, show your diligence and participate with uh, with us as we go through Scripture. Welcome, everybody, on Zoom. You look lovely. Uh, it's good to see some people I haven't seen in, in a few weeks, so welcome back. Uh, your presence is greatly missed, and thank you for those who, um, who support us regularly on YouTube and on Zoom. We are grateful for your participation. It's an inspiration to us. It helps keep us motivated. Uh, we want to thank everybody on YouTube for subscribing and uh, sharing the videos. It's nice to see the, the views going up. Um, you know, we're, we're studying something that maybe a lot of people don't know as much about as they thought they did in the sanctuary. You know, so this is a um, pretty important study. So keep it up. If you need a copy of the syllabus and you're on Zoom, Paul has put in the chat window all the links to our social media and to a PDF where you can download a digital copy for free. And after the Sabbath, he's got another link in there that you can click on or you can purchase a copy because um, I know he's still we're still finding typos and you know it's not perfect. You know, so we, you uh, you really got to be on it here and and correct verse typos and words and that kind of stuff. So I, I kind of like having the physical copy, Paul, because it forces us to do that. You know, you're like, you got to go through everything because um, it's easy uh, to put a wrong verse down. And right. And uh, so you guys are the ones who have to help us do that. And some of you, some of you do that pretty good with us. So we appreciate you. Um, any other, I don't think we have any other comments. We got a full study tonight. Um, I think what's going on uh, in regards to, um, this so all right nobody's logging on at the moment so let's go ahead and pray real quick and we'll get started with this study heavenly father we're so grateful that you created us because you love us and that um, that you are all things that are good um, there is none like you uh, that you're just that you're merciful you're so patient and uh, so forgiving uh, to a, to a world that doesn't deserve it and so we ask for your forgiveness from our sins, for where we failed you and each other. Help us to be better today, uh, better uh, as a result of this study uh, than we were earlier today and uh, even yesterday. We want our experience with you closer. As we know as we draw closer to you, you draw closer to us, and we all draw closer to each other. We want to understand what your, what your word says, so we ask for the guidance of the Holy Spirit uh, so that these words have meaning, that we don't just read the scripture, but that we study them, that we eat them, um, that it becomes eternal life in our in our blood, in our bones. Uh, we just want to uh, be wellsprings of, of water uh, wherever we go. So we're grateful for the Sabbath. Thank you um, for resting and giving us a memorial where we can uh, praise you and adore you for, for creating us and for redeeming us. So thank you for sustaining us. And we just pray for each person that's on Zoom and on YouTube, that you would be with them uh, in the special way that they need you. And thank you that the Holy Spirit's working in their life, that they're participating in this study. And we just ask that you would bless them richly in their, their household, in their communities, their churches. And that we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, let's pick up. We're on page 96. If this is the first time you're joining us, thank you for joining us. We would encourage you to pause this video if you're watching it on YouTube and uh, start at the beginning because we built up a foundation to where we're at um, today. And this study is a continuation of last week's uh, study. But um, let's go ahead and pick up where it says historical type on the top of near the top of page 96. And it says the historical type Moses clothed Aaron with the garments of the high priest and then anointed him with oil. The sons of Aaron, who were also were also clothed and anointed to serve as a priesthood. The sanctuary also was anointed with oil, and the entire ceremony lasted seven days. Let's read this in Leviticus 
chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. It says, And Moses said to the congregation, This is what the Lord commanded to be done. Then Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water, and he put the tunic on him, girded him with the sash, clothed him with the robe, and put the ephod on him. And he girded him with the intricately woven band of the ephod, and with it tied the ephod on him. And then he put the breastplate on him, and he put the urim and the thummim and the breastplate, and he put the turban on his head. Also on the turban, on its front, he put the golden plate, the holy crown, as the Lord had commanded Moses. Also Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it. He consecrated them. He sprinkled some of it on the altar seven times, anointed the altar and all its utensils, and the laver and its base to consecrate, uh, to consecrate them. And he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. Then Moses brought Aaron's sons and put tunics on them, girded them with sashes and put hats on them as the Lord had commanded Moses. Notice this text that, uh, that David writes in Psalm 133. This is one of my favorite texts in regards to uh, the anointing of the high priest, you know, what, what we just read in Leviticus, it sounds like, you know, um, Moses put, you know, some oil on on uh, Aaron's head. And um, if you've ever uh, seen an anointing in a church before, you know, elders do it, pastors do it, especially for those who are um, who are sick or, or an ailment. Um, they'll put, you know, drops of oil on the head. But notice how David uh, writes it in Psalm 133 it says, behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Very interesting, right? This is uh, uh, reminds us of what Acts chapter 2 says. It says, It's like the precious oil upon the head, running down the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down the on the edge of his garment. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing life for more. So you have uh, more of a visual with what uh, David's talking about here, uh, like it's being dumped almost on him, right? That it's running down um, his face, his beard, his clothing down to um, the ground. And we'll talk a little bit more about that verse uh, coming up, up here in a few minutes. So let's continue in Psalm. We'll look at chapter 110, verses 1 through 4. It says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And then also in Psalm chapter 16, verse 8 through 11, we read, I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life in your presence is full fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So did you notice the order there of the text that we just read through? The dressing of uh, the priest Moses dresses Aaron, um, and you get the details there. Then he anoints Aaron and uh, the sanctuary, and uh, you get another perspective of it with um, really the awesomeness of it with what David writes um, in the psalm. And then you see... Uh, the sitting at my right hand, you know, that the Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion uh, to rule, you know, so very interesting this order, nothing arbitrary here, but let's look now at the prophetic antitype here. And this is on page 97 with several events that took place when Jesus arrived, when he arrived in heaven upon his ascension. So notice these bullet points here, the most significant event at Pentecost took place where? Now, I know you're all muted, you know, but uh, in here you're, you're not, right? It took place in heaven. When we think Pentecost, oftentimes, and rightfully so, we think of just Acts chapter 2. 
Um, but here, what we've read uh, in the Old Testament, actually, there's uh, amazing uh, historical types of this, right? So the most significant event at Pentecost took place in heaven, not on earth. The next bullet point, uh, Jesus presented himself before the Father as the slain lamb, and we see that in Revelation 5, verses 9 through 12. The Father clothed Jesus with the garments of the high priest and then anointed him with oil to serve as high priest over his people. And you can read that in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, which we'll read some of these texts again a little later on. So the Father clothes Jesus. So Moses, when he clothed Aaron, who is Moses a type of? He's a type of the Father. You know, so uh, very, sometimes we just think it's, you know, only types of Christ, but we actually see, um, you know, the Father and Son relationship throughout uh, the Old Testament and Scripture as well. So as high priest, he stands. But as king of the kingdom of grace, he sits with his Father on his throne. And there's quite a few verses here you can read. Uh, you can check out Acts 2, 29 through 36, Revelation 3, 21 and 12, 5, Psalm 110, 1 through 4, which we just read, uh, Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, as well as chapter 7, 17 through 22. Again, we are going to read some of these verses here in a bit. Um, the priesthood of Aaron defines the functions of Jesus, but the... Sorry, let me try it again. The priesthood of Aaron defines the functions of Jesus, but the right to the priesthood comes from Melchizedek. Right, and Melchizedek was both king and priest. You can read about him in the Old Testament as well. Now, next, you have the sanctuary where Jesus is to serve is anointed. Uh, again, another text for you to look up, uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. And please look these verses up. It's important. We're going to try to read as many as we can, but um, it's a Bible study. And uh, you gotta you gotta put in the the elbow grease uh, as well with us. And the final bullet point here: uh, Jesus will now feed his church with the bread, the bread of the presence, aka the showbread. Um, he will give them oil so that they can be a light to the world, the seven branch candlesticks or candelabrum, and he will receive the prayers of his people at the altar of incense. So again, how important is it to understand the sanctuary? You know, as we as we see this, I mean, this is it, it's all point. The sanctuary is pointing to Christ and the work that He uh, in the Old Testament that He would do. Um, we see it now as the work He hasn't and He is doing, and also will do. Look, we want to know where Jesus is at, what He's doing, what where we are at in the streams of time um, as a people on this planet. Um, follow Christ through the sanctuary. And you'll see exactly where we are and, um, and the streams of time and how close we are uh, to time really being almost wrapped up uh, here on this planet. Now, is it just possible that the ascension took three days? Remember, seven days to anoint. And how long was it from when Christ ascended uh, to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? It was 10 days, right? So um, when Christ ascended, 10 days later, the Holy Spirit was poured out. Um, upon the uh, 120 in the upper room. Uh, so is it possible that the ascension then maybe took three days? And the clothing of Jesus and the anointing of the sanctuary uh, of the sanctuary and the high priest took seven days. The oil, so to speak, was abundant that it trickled down the beard, down the garments, Psalm 133, all the way down to the mountains of Zion where the believers were gathered in the upper room. So let's notice here Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, and it says, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now, we, we did do a study on this, Paul. It's on our Revelation 7 seals, and it's actually the introduction uh, chapter. So it would be the first few studies that we have a playlist on, um, Revelation chapter 4 and 5. Uh, there's a lot more uh, information uh, during the time period in heaven of those 10 days um, where Jesus was ascending 
um, to heaven after uh, his resurrection and then 40 days on the earth. So uh, if you want more information on that, we did do studies. Uh, we would uh, encourage you to check that out. Uh, I've got a couple of comments here. Hoku's talking about the order of Melchizedek was one of a kind. Uh, there was only one. And that's true. That's why it was applicable to Jesus. And the Aaronic priesthood, yeah, symbolizes humans collaborating with God because it was passed down generation to generation. Yeah, so um, good, good comments. Uh, very important to understand um, as we try to learn about who Jesus is, you know, and what he's doing. And remember, when Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen who? The Father. You've seen the Father, right? That's right. So how important is it that we see Jesus, where he's at and what he's doing? Like we can, we can relate to the humanity of Jesus. That's why he came down in human form. So by understanding Jesus, divinity wrapped with humanity, who are we also able to understand? We're able to understand the Father. You know, so uh, amazing that um, bridge and the gap from earth to heaven, right? That's why that's why Christ is is the ladder um, from from this planet to uh, to heaven. But uh, let's continue on. Uh, Revelation chapter one verses twelve and thirteen. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. This is John talking here. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. This is the sash of the high priest. Did we read about this in the Old Testament? Did, did uh, the way Aaron was dressed and what he was dressed with, did it point to um, how Christ would be dressed? And then who would dress him for what function was he doing it? So um, very neat to see the prophetic fulfillment of what we studied in, in the Old Testament. But let's continue on. So in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the mm -hmm. Lord erected and not man. Yeah. So where's the true tabernacle? Heaven. It's up in heaven, right? So the sanctuary on earth is what? It's an arrow. It's a telescope. It's pointing to the true of what's taking place in heaven. Let's continue with Acts chapter 2, verse 29 through 36. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and unburied and is... I'm sorry, dead and buried. He is definitely buried. And his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn an oath with him, that of the fruit of his body, according to flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God had raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And the word Christ means anointed. Jesus was anointed already for his public ministry when he was baptized, but now he's anointed uh, for a new function, and that's high priest. So continuing on, let's notice here Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. It says, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And in Hebrews 7, 20 through 22, we read, And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more... Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Again, we're studying the prophetic antitype, so the fulfillment here of what we read in the Old Testament, and again, back in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven 
as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And Paul, the text that you read in Revelation 5, it says, uh, John sees a lamb as though it had been slain. So it's, you know, it's the, the imagery is pointing out Jesus is, is um, fresh from resurrection, right, from the crucifixion. And then it says in that verse uh, that the seven spirits, that would be the Holy Spirit in its fullness, and that's Revelation 5, 6, were sent out to the earth. So when we look at Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4 here, we see the effect of the Holy Spirit being poured out um, onto those apostles in the upper room. Um, but prior to that, we see what's taking place in heaven in Revelation chapter 5. So uh, let's continue on. Uh, so in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, page 38 and 39, we read Christ's ascension to heaven was the signal that his followers were to receive the promised blessing. For this, they were to wait before they entered upon their work. When Christ passed within the heavenly gates, he was enthroned amidst the adoration of the angels. As soon as this ceremony was completed, the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples in rich currents, and Christ was indeed glorified, even with the glory which he had with the Father from all eternity. The Pentecostal outpouring was heaven's communication that the Redeemer's inauguration was accomplished. According to his promise, he had sent the Holy Spirit from heaven to his followers as a token that he had, as priest and king, received all authority in heaven and on earth, and was the anointed one over his people." Oh man, this just opens uh, the eyes and the mind to a lot more understanding of uh, what took place in Pentecost. And also, one of the reasons Paul I really enjoy this study is it shows us how saturated Scripture is with the uh, historical types of Pentecost. You know, with the gathering together, the being in unity, the clothing of the priest, the anointing of the priest, and and the sanctuary. And then to be able to see it fulfilled here in the text we read in the New Testament is pretty amazing. Now, your syllabus will say that there isn't time to study the two thrones of Jesus, but we are going to study the two thrones. So I kind of scribbled out some of those words here because I'm going to put, I just put study the two thrones of Jesus, the throne of grace and the throne of glory. And we're going to look these texts up. Um, but uh, first we wanted to play the video of the table of showbread. And what's being read here, um, the, the narrator is from, uh, Exodus 25, verses 23 through 30. So let's hear this uh, one more time, Paul. You shall also make a table of acacia wood. Two cubits shall be its length, a cubit its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold and make a moulding of gold all around. You shall make for it a frame of a handbreadth all around and you shall make a gold moulding for the frame all around. And you shall make for it four rings of gold, and put the rings on the four corners that are on its four legs. The rings shall be close to the frame, as holders for the poles to bear the table. And you shall make the poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold, that the table may be carried with them. You shall make its dishes, its pans, its pitchers, and its bowls for pouring, you shall make them of pure gold. You shall set the showbread on the table before me, always. All right, so please have your Bibles ready. These texts that you see on page 98 and 99, we are going to go through. Um, please keep up, but listen to the, and search and see the common uh, theme here as we go through these texts. I'm going to start with uh, Zechariah. If you're wondering, well, why do we play the table of showbread? Because this, when Christ, uh, before he could enter the sanctuary in heaven, in the holy place, he had to go through this, uh, the anoint this process, what we've just studied here in, in this chapter. And as he goes into the holy place, 
we know that the altar of incense, uh, the the candles, the lampstands, Paul read about uh, in uh, Rome, uh, Revelation chapter one as well, and um, the table of showbread are all in the holy place. So it's very important that we understand what those articles represent. Again, if this is the first time you're joining us in our study, uh, we encourage you to start at the beginning. Last week, um, the, the entire sanctuary with the video, uh, the visual aid. So again, we'd recommend that you check that out so you can get the full experience of it. But um, there's something special about the table of showbread. It sits on the side of the north in the holy place. And it also had two crown moldings on it and two stacks of bread. Let's notice in Zechariah now, chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. Zechariah 6, 12 and 13 says, Then speak to him, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, from his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. In Matthew chapter 21, 41 through 46, it says, They said to him, He will, re he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parable, they perceived that he was speaking of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. Now let's keep on with Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. And this is the promise that Jesus gives uh, to those who, who uh, accept the counsel from him. Uh, in regards to the church of Laodicea here. But notice this, Revelation 3.21, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat with my father on his throne. Did Jesus sit with his father on his throne? Would there be two seats? Would there be two crown moldings? Would there be the two stacks of bread? Would they be sitting on the sides of the north? Uh, very important details, right? Let's continue on. So in Revelation 12, 5, we're again going to see the same thing, God and his throne. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. I was going to leave no doubt that Jesus was caught up to his father, right, Paul? It's been, this is just a little sampling of, uh, of texts here, but let's keep on. Uh, Psalm 110, are you guys keeping up? Psalm 110, verse 1 says, The Lord said to my Lord, um, by the way, in your Bibles, you may see that the first Lord is all capital letters, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Um, that would be Yahweh or Jehovah um, said to my Lord. Then you have a capital L, but lowercase O-R-D. That would be Adonai. This is the father saying, talking to his son, right? So it says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And then let's look at Acts uh, chapter 2, verses 33 through 35. We're going to see here the mention of sitting at the right hand, as well as uh, a reference to what Ben just read uh, in Psalms 110. Um, it says, starting in verse 33, Therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, and this is where he references Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And verse 30, oh no, that was it, sorry. That was it, yeah. That's, uh, and I, it's funny, I, I have that little, maybe your Bibles have it, but I'd write in the text that, you know, that uh, you can reference other, other texts. 
um, in regards to that. Let's notice uh, the end of Mark, Mark chapter 16, verse 19. And again, where did Jesus go when he ascended? That's what all of these texts, Old and New Testament, tell us. Mark 16, 19 says, So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, that's his disciples, um, that's Acts chapter 1, by the way, but after he had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. In Acts chapter 5, verse 31, again, we're going to see another reference to the right hand of God. It says, Him God has exalted to His right hand to be Prince and Savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Let's continue on uh, with the next book, uh, Romans. This is 34. Romans 8, 34 says, Who is He who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God who always makes intercession for us. In Ephesians 1 verse 20, we're going to again see here the reference to at the right hand, but we're going to see also that he is seated. Uh, so Ephesians 1 verse 20 says, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Let's go to Colossians, one of the small books in the New Testament. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Chapter 3, verse 1 says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are where? Which are above. Where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Uh, now we're going to spend a little time in Hebrews here, uh, yeah. starting in chapter 1. Uh, we're going to look at verses 3 and 13, again, referencing the right hand, as well as another reference to Psalm 110 again. Um, so starting in verse 3, it says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And verse 13, it says, but to which of the angels uh, has he ever said, and this is that reference to Psalm, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So is Jesus king and is he priest? You know, we're, we're seeing that, right? We're, we're seeing this. So let's, let's get, uh, we're still in the book of Hebrews. Let's go to chapter eight, go over a, a, a few chapters, chapter eight, and we'll read verse one and two. It says, now this is the man, the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. Uh, keep going in Hebrews, a uh, couple chapters to chapter 12, um, and we'll look at verses 1 and 2. Um, I think you're going to start to get the picture here. Uh, we're seeing a lot yeah. of similar verbiage used. Um, so verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who... For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Yeah, where was Jesus walking in Revelation chapter 1? In the midst of the candles, right? And who does that? Who walks in the holy place? The priest does, right? Notice uh, Hebrews chapter 4, and we'll pick up at verse 14 through 16 here. It says, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly, where? To the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And then our last one in Hebrews here, go back to chapter 2, 
And we'll look at verses 17 and 18, um, referencing Jesus again as the high priest. Um, it says, Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll read verses 24 through 28. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 28. And it says, Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the son of himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him that God may be all in all. Now, in my in my Bible, Paul, I have, you probably see a little bit, this is all circled here because all the he's and hymns you need to go through and you can if you if you study that closely which he and him is it talking about and you're right on there the father the son the father the son it's actually pretty neat i've got written um it's probably good that you would do that or maybe you're not sure which he or him is being discussed there but um uh, clearly this uh relationship with the father and the son and then the rule um for jesus um as king and um given to him by his father and the last verse we have here uh, in the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 31, it says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All right, let's move on. Uh, let's look at the next historical type. Uh, so Israel officially became God's covenant people by marriage at Mount Sinai. Check out Exodus 19, verses 1 through 6, as well as Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33. Uh, the blood of the Passover lamb redeemed Israel. Their old life of slavery had been buried in the baptismal waters of the Red Sea, 1 Corinthians 10, 2. They had resurrected to newness of life from the waters, and now they were to be incorporated officially as God's church. They were free from service from their taskmaster, taskmaster, and now they were free to serve God as their king. God also established them as a kingdom of priests to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth. You see that in 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. Now let's look at Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 6 here. And it says, In the third month, after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day, they came to the wilderness of Sinai, for they had departed from Rephidim and had come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain, and Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if, so there's a condition here, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. And we'll read the other text that was mentioned a little earlier. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 and 32 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. Here's a quote from Prophets, page 303, says, 
Soon after the encampment at Sinai, Moses was called up into the mountain to meet with God. Alone, he climbed the steep and rugged path and drew near to the cloud that marked the place of Jehovah's presence. Israel was now to be taken into a close and peculiar relation to the Most High, to be incorporated as a church and a nation under the government of God. So again, you see that priest and king, you know, you see that relationship of church um, and government, not the world's version of it, mind you. We've done studies on that in Daniel and in Revelation as well, but um, I don't want to digress into that. Let's keep moving forward. <laughs> Let's notice in Zechariah chapter 8, verses 20 through 23, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Peoples shall yet come, inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us continue to go and pray before the Lord and seek the Lord of hosts. I myself will go also. Yes, many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, 10 men from every language of the nations shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man saying, let us go with you for we have heard that God is with you. Uh, continuing with this theme here of being a church and nation, Isaiah 49, six says, indeed he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Uh, here in uh, Deuteronomy, we're going to again kind of see this conditional aspect. Um, it says, surely I have taught you statutes and judgments just as the Lord my God commanded that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore, be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. So are you getting a little bit better understanding of uh, how Israel was in the Old Testament? A lot of people are confused. Um, you know, they think that it's a different, uh, that God was a different God uh, in the Old Testament, but as Israel is a different Israel in the Old Testament. And that's what we're going to, we're going to notice here. So you see um, what the old covenant was, but the allusion, um, the pointing to what the new covenant would be. So let's, let's look at that now in the prophetic antitype. The Christian church became God's new covenant people by marriage at Pentecost. Please look up these verses. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, Acts 2, 41 and 46. Jesus died, was buried, resurrected, and then at the time of Pentecost, he made his church the new Israel. More text, Acts chapter 2, 36, 5, 31, and Hebrews 8, 8 for you to check out. This is apostolic Israel with Christ as the chief cornerstone and the apostles as the 12 foundations. The rock was smitten and the water of the Holy Spirit gushed out. The sacrifice was made and fire consumed the sacrifice. And then the church was officially incorporated as God's covenant people. When God accepted a sacrifice, did fire come down from heaven? You know, read that with Elijah. Uh, with Solomon. And uh, you see, what, did, did the Father accept the sacrifice that Jesus made? Did fire come down from heaven at Pentecost? Absolutely. It was a, a tongues of fire above the heads of, uh, of the apostles. The church had been freed from service to their taskmaster, and now it was free to serve Jesus as their king. God also established them as a kingdom of priests, to proclaim the gospels to the end of the earth. And again, that verse Paul made reference to in 1 Peter 2, uh, verses 9 and 10, right? We're a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. The church was to be a witness to the world. The small nucleus of Jews in the upper room was empowered to witness to all nations. You get the, the gospel commission at the end of uh, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, and bring in an abundant harvest of souls. His people on earth 
now a royal priesthood, also received the anointing of the Holy Spirit and were to serve as volunteers to proclaim the good news with power. The oil with which Jesus was anointed on the day of Pentecost was so abundant that it trickled down from heaven to the apostles who are waiting in the upper room, right? Down the, down the beard of Jesus, down his garments, you know, and the, the dew as the mountain, uh, on the mountains of Hermon, but it, it, uh, it came all the way down from heaven to the upper room. How amazing is that? The purpose of the gift of tongues was so that the apostles could announce to the nations what was happening in heaven. So people would come to Jesus, the high priest, for forgiveness and cleansing on an individual, personal basis. Please study Acts chapter 2. They could now claim the benefits of Christ's atonement. So let's look at Acts chapter 13, verses 46 through 48. It says, Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, Behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And, and this is why having the syllabus, I think, is a, a benefit. We've got certain parts of verses underlined and in bold there, but uh, light to the Gentiles to be salvation to the ends of the earth. Uh, where is the gospel message to be proclaimed? Everywhere. Where does God, where does God have people? Everywhere. Don't look to one particular place on the planet, you know, for prophetic events to uh, unfold. It's uh, throughout the entire planet. It's uh, it's globally. We're not talking about literal um, Israel. Now we're talking about spiritual Israel. Uh, let's continue with the text we've made reference to a couple of times in First Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are, are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So let's continue on and look at another historical type. <clears throat> so at Sinai, God wrote his law on Moses' heart. The meekness of Moses during the 40-year sojourn is proof of this. And his face shone with the glory of God, uh, Exodus 34. God wanted the same for Israel. So let's look at Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Now you'll notice that these verses directly address what God wanted for all Israel at Sinai. The Holy Spirit who wrote the law with tongues of fire on tables of stone, Deuteronomy 30, 33 verse 2, wanted to write it on the fleshy tables of Israel's hearts, Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27, Hebrews 8, 7 through 13, as well as 2 Corinthians 3. You see those all there. Yeah, and you see that that expression used throughout the Old Testament, um, that he wants to take out the stony hearts, you know, and uh, and write on their, their hearts of flesh. Remember, the covenant formula is, I will be their God, and they will be my people. That doesn't change, right? God, 
God doesn't change. So when we when we study old covenant versus new covenant, you know, what's the difference in, and you see how he's in the text that we read in Jeremiah, Jeremiah, it says my covenant, which they broke. God didn't break his covenant. You know, God, God is the same. Um, They, they actually broke it pretty quickly. Didn't they? When you look at uh, what happened uh, in the, in the wilderness, when they made this promise, all this we will do, they say, and then they're dancing around an idol, you know, that they had um, Aaron made, you know? So, and then of course you can see, uh, the process that that took place, the the degrading of um, of Israel in in the wilderness, um, but God did it. Did His law change from the old to the new covenant? Nope, didn't change. What changed? Where it was written, right? So they they had they saw the tablets of stone written by the finger of God, and He says, "I will put my law in their minds, and I'll write it on their hearts." So it's not um, the law that changed; it's where it was where it was written. Now there's a double promise given at Sinai. Jesus is presented as the high priest in Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. And then the double blessing of his priesthood is described in verses 7 through 13. Jesus will forgive sins and write his law upon human hearts. God appeared at Sinai in fire, wind, and earthquake. These are the same phenomena that took place on the day of Pentecost. And we we went over that in the study. The law of God was written on tables of stone by the finger of God, Exodus 31, 8, 18. And the finger of God is the Holy Spirit. You ever thought that? We Oh, man. We're, all right. You got to read these texts in your own because we're almost out of time. But um, Matthew 12, 28 and Luke eleven twenty, the synoptic gospels. Notice um, those two uh, on how I believe it's the casting out of... Um, I think uh, demons or something like that, you know, but the Holy Spirit's called the finger of God. That's that's the point. Matthew 12, 28, 11, 20, check it out. Um, but let's go to Hebrews 8, 7 through 13 real quick. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day when I took them out of the hand. You kind of get that uh, repetition here. It's quoting Jeremiah. Um, lead them out because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. And again, he says, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And let's go to the next historical type there. So the Jewish tradition has it that God spoke the law at Mount Sinai from the midst of the fire in 70 different languages so that all nations could understand God's law. Now the source here is Edward Chumney, The Seven Feasts of the Messiah, page 80, um, and Exodus Rabbah 5.9 Midrash in Deuteronomy 4.33-36. God speaking is related to fire just like at Pentecost. A very good reference there. And then we'll wrap this up with the prophetic antitype here. The apostles saw tongues of fire and spoke the gospel in the languages of the nations gathered there. Christ had gained the benefit of salvation by his perfect life and death. And these were then available to everyone who that personally would claim them. What good would it do for Jesus to carry on such a ministry in heaven if no one on earth knew about it? In the Jewish agricultural year, the seed of wheat that was planted in the fall was watered by the rain that fell between Passover and Pentecost. And then the reaping of the grain took place at Pentecost. Jesus had watered the seed at Passover and the harvest at Pentecost was the fruit of his labors. And notice this last quote in Desire of Ages 192. Jesus said to the disciples, I sent you to reap that whereon you bestowed no labor. Other men labored and you are entered into their labors. The Savior was here looking forward to the great ingathering on the day of Pentecost. The disciples were not to regard this as a result of their own efforts. They were entering into other men's labors. Ever since the fall of Adam, Christ had been committing the seed of the word to his chosen servants to be sown in human hearts. And an unseen agency, even an omnipotent power, had worked silently but effectually to produce the harvest. The dew, rain, and sunshine of God's grace had been given to refresh and nourish the seed of truth. Christ was about to water the seed with his own blood. Wow. 
His disciples were privileged to be laborers together with God. They were co-workers with Christ and with the holy men of old. By the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, thousands were to be converted in a day. This was the result of Christ sowing the harvest of his work. Wow. Next week, we're going to deal with the fruits of Pentecost, but go over this study again. Uh, there's a lot of information that we covered. Go through those texts again. But Paul, I think it's been pretty clear just from the, the few verses, which quite a few verses, um, what Jesus is doing, where he's at right now, um, why he's there, and what our part is um, in all of this amazing plan of salvation. All right, let's go ahead and close uh, with prayer. Let's do it. Father God in heaven, we thank you again for another day of life. We thank you for your love, your mercy. Um, we thank you for what you're doing for us, Lord, uh, for interceding uh, on our behalf uh, for the sins that we commit, Lord, um, for taking the result of those sins upon yourself. Father, we uh, just pray now uh, for this Sabbath day uh, as it comes in that uh, we would keep this day special. Um, we know you set this day aside for us to spend with you, Lord. Um, so I pray that uh, we would uphold our part, our end of the deal, that we would uh, keep it special and uh, keep you in our minds always. Uh, we pray for your angels' guidance and protection as we come together tomorrow. Um, and just bless our minds, our hearts, uh, be with our words, our thoughts and actions, that we would each and every day better represent you, Lord, um, to those around us. We thank you for all you do again. Uh, we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we all have a part to play. Plant the seeds, and the harvest is uh, is going to be ripe, but the workers few. Be, be those few workers. God bless you. Have a happy Sabbath. We'll see you next week.